Hi, my name is Jennifer Best, and I'm the head of marketing at All American Entertainment, also known as AAE Speakers Bureau. We work with event professionals and meeting organizers to help book celebrities, entertainers, and speakers for events and conferences. I'm excited today to be talking with Luke Getting from Puffingston Presentations, which is an award-winning visual agency out of Austin. I was really impressed after seeing Luke present on virtual event tips and engagement. And I thought that with the shift towards hybrid events later this year and into 2022, a lot of you like me are considering how we can make these even more engaging, interactive and cohesive between virtual and in-person attendees. So Luke is the founder and chief evangelist for Puffingston. And he's here to talk with us today about a few things we need to consider when planning for to create dynamic hybrid events. Hi, Luke. Hey, Jennifer. Excited to chat events. And obviously, pretty much everyone watching this video, I assume, is excited about the prospect of finally being able to get together uh, in person again. Yes. Well, of course, um, perhaps <laughs> combining some of the best practices that we learned virtually as well. Yeah, no, definitely. So let's not wait. Let's dig right in. Um, let's dig in with what we need to consider before our hybrid events. So what do you recommend we consider when we start planning our event? One of the things that really excited me about this transition to virtual was the attention paid to the, the kind of the viewing uh, setup, if you will, on a lot of these platforms. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we, in, for in-person events, you do have some say uh, as a client if it's a, if it's a hosted event, but many times as a speaker, you just show up and everything's set up, the stage is ready to go, and, and there's limited control. And, and I really appreciated the amount of attention and detail that companies put into virtual events. And in some cases, there were platforms where you could even, as the viewer, change your own experience. You could you could bring the the speaker's video larger, the the on screen visual aids larger, and configure based on the situation. And so. In terms of in-person events, I would uh, I encourage companies to think about how do we create a view that's um, that we can kind of capture both the speaker and the visual aids, but also in that overwhelm. I think in the last year or two pre-pandemic, we started to see these just enormous displays with all kinds of on-screen graphics, which were pretty cool, but almost at times became visual clutter. Uh, and then, you know, looking at the virtual context, I really have appreciated the companies that spent time. Um, I think some of my favorites views were kind of split screen where you could see the speaker and his or her kind of a full body. So you could get that range of motion while at the same time, you could see their visual aids if that was something that was featured uh, for their talk. Yeah, no, I, I love what you just said about visual clutter. I, I completely agree with you. I think that it's very cool at an onset to see um, some of the some of the graphics and creative that have been coming out, and um, but yeah, it can be visual cluttered. It can be overwhelming at times. So, um, I mean, I've but seen I know setups, I've <laughs> seen setups where you can barely see the speaker anymore. <laughs> you know, right. Little ant on this crazy display movie theater like experience. Well, we're all about speakers and we want them to shine. So <laughs> we don't like that. Uh, but I know that you've got a lot of great experience driving virtual engagement. So what tools and tips do you have for us on how to combine our audiences digitally? Yeah, so I think this is going to be the big challenge and big opportunity as we look toward hybrid events. How do we consider bringing together our in-person audiences and our virtual audiences? I think so many companies and events have realized the potential of allowing anyone from around the world to participate in these events and expanding an audience as much as we would all love to. Most of us have five, 10, 20 partners, vendors, uh, clients that we work with. We can't, we can't spend our entire year going to events, but we might be able to just pop on for a few hours or a day or two virtually. And so I think the real exciting thing will be companies who embrace trying to engage both the in-person and the virtual audiences. Uh, in many ways, one thing that was really neat in virtual was chat and, and polling and things that created a bit of a two-way experience, having the host uh, ask questions to the speaker here and there. And you know, there's, there's kind of this, this vibe in person for keynote speakers, especially where it's like, you just let them talk for whatever, 45 minutes, there's no interruption. You might take a question or two and then it's over. And, and I think we kind of got away from that in a positive way virtually. And so I'd love to retain that. And just, I think to try to sell it to you, because I know for a lot of you, especially if you're producing events, this is a big ask, but the, the thing that excites me the most 
is this is an opportunity. Think of a poll. If you were to ask an audience of people who vlogged in remotely and are attending in person, like that is one of your top audiences, your most engaged people. I would argue that their feedback is even more valuable than sending like a newsletter and asking people to survey though, because I think you're getting different people responding. So finding ways to involve both of those audiences and potentially allowing them to even interact among each other. So you asked me about a tool, Jennifer, like an example is a tool like Slido, where okay. you can log in remotely, you can log in on your phone in, in the actual um, event itself, and you can participate in the exact same polls, chats, upvote questions for the Q&A portion. And there's many tools like that, uh, many times built into the native uh, like C-Event like app platforms. Wow, no, that's that's a great tip for hybrid events is to really figure out that tech side of things and to make sure that you're bringing consistency to both audiences. And I think by centralizing it, like you just explained, um, that will provide a cohesive experience for the attendees. But I think you're right too on the, the feedback comment you made about collecting feedback from people while they're at your event is, is really going to be that most impactful result that you're going to want to get. It's such valuable information and just leveraging that again, just imagine the kind of typical scenario, 500 to 1,000 of probably your most engaged people sitting there with you, as well as people who took time out of their day remotely. I and mean, wouldn't you love to get some really great feedback from them and allow them to see what are their top questions, see what are their top poll results? Could be incredible. So one of my favorite things and why I was so excited to talk to you, Luke, is that um, when you gave your presentation that I caught on virtual event engagement, um, it was at a point where I thought we'd seen just about everything there was to see about virtual event engagement and working in this field. I, um, you know, I went into it like, okay, let's see what let's see what he has to say, and I was pleasantly surprised. And I thought that um, the way that you approach presentations in that you will engage with the audience and give them an option of how to navigate through your presentation was unique. And that if somebody comes in and say you have three topics to choose from and which one do you want to hear about first, and then having the audience make that decision just made me feel like I was actually part of the presentation itself. Exactly. Yeah, my working theory, which I think feels valid at this point, is that us as speakers, we're always going to have way more to share than we could ever do, hope to in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, even an hour. And ultimately, I find that sometimes the most engaging parts of the, of the moments shared between the, is really this one-time experience are the Q&A elements, right? But at the same time, sometimes panels can become just bouncing a little bit all over the place. So it's like, how, how, do, we, how do we find the best of both worlds between the prepared keynote and the more interactive panel-like or Q&A-like situation. And so what I like to do when I encourage speakers to do to really help involve their audiences more is to really create their content in sort of chunks or modules. And so as you experienced, Jennifer, I would prepare a little preview and I had strategized three sections of different content we could discuss. And I would share a quick preview of all three and I would throw it over to a poll and my audience would weigh in either using the webinar platform or, or a tool like Slido and whatever they voted for, that's how I would uh, cover the content and, and prioritize in that order. And it just takes so much pressure off me as a speaker, off event organizers, because instead of just making an assumption that this is going to align with the interests of the audience who showed up that day, um, we can actually just ask them, <laughs> just check on them. That's the easiest way to get that information. Seems obvious, but there's so many times, I'm sure many of you can think of a time where you, you showed up based on a description of a session and you were there for an hour and it really wasn't even aligned with what you had originally thought it was going to be. And so I just loved that experience. It took pressure off of me. It also made every time I actually gave this talk dozens of times over the pandemic and each one was a little bit different because I never knew how the audience was going to vote and we covered content in different orders. Sometimes we would spend all our time on certain sections and it still ended up being a really great experience for the audience. So yeah, yeah I would uh, absolutely encourage people to think about breaking it up into uh, bite-sized modules and allowing the audience to weigh in. Yeah, and there were two, two points that I think it's really important for our audience to understand. One, by having just two to three main points to get across made the session feel digestible, like as an attendee, like I didn't feel like you had to try to get everything in. You just had the top three things 
Um, and two, the content didn't necessarily change. You had the same presentation, um, you knew the sections, all that really was changing was which one went first. And so I know that um, some people might be concerned or raise a concern about, oh, that's way too much variation. I'd be nervous that things could go wrong. But in essence, the, the presentation didn't change. There was the same content. It was just the order in the, which the slides were delivered, right? Yeah, it's a philosophy of ours from the outside. And everyone generally says this, but how many people actually practice it is, it's, is it a speaker first approach or is it an audience first approach, right? It's very comfortable for me to show up and give a memorized speech for 30 minutes right. uh, and not allow anyone to interact with me whatsoever and then scramble off stage. Mm -hmm. But what's more valuable for my audience is to invite them. But at the same time, again, it's not just a random Q and A. All those con all that content was pre prepared. Obviously, I'd practiced it and strategized it. So, like you said, Jennifer, it's it's really, in my opinion, the best of both worlds there. Um, and we're really looking at it in an audience first uh, methodology. Before we wrap up today, I wanted to find out from you, what advice do you have for how to handle separated in-person and hybrid events? So as in they're not streamed simultaneously, but they happen at separate times or sometimes in separate places. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that'll be the thing. I absolutely appreciate the technical challenges of trying to combine it. I think the, the exciting news is there could be really opportunities to create really neat uh, separate events as well. I think the main question becomes, do you ask your speakers to kind of duplicate their efforts or do you record their initial, perhaps the in-person first and then uh, show it in the virtual experiences? Either way, I think you should really encourage and invite your speakers and your panelists to play a role in the virtual edition, assuming it's a separate one. Um, you can still, of course, play back their, their remarks from the event itself, but have them, I mean, participate in the chat. Have them, um, one thing that I think could be really neat is asking them, hey, can you hang around for a, another half hour slot, let's say, and take an immediate kind of Q&A discussion group after their event. That's very hard to pull off uh, in a, for an in-person event because people are scrambling so much. So I think there could be neat ways to actually make the experience just as good uh, and a little bit different in a virtual capacity. The other thing I think just really trying to get away from just throwing the recording up and making it feel like you're watching a YouTube video. I think even if you can retain things like, let's say there was a chat during the live experience, if you can make sure that gets retained and actually kind of plays back the way that it normally would in a uh, for the for the live edition, things like that just just really retain all the the best practices that we experienced when we were doing all these things virtual. We were all chatting with each other uh, as we experienced these keynotes. So I think doing that it would all be great. And then my my kind of last tip for speakers. Uh, and people who are coaching speakers in this type of context is to consider whether live or in person, or excuse me, whether live or virtually, consider the audience that is logging in remotely as another stakeholder in your event, for example. So what I mean is a lot of times when you're scanning the audience, we all got used to try to practice to look at the webcam, right? Look at the camera, because mm -hmm. that's gonna make that connection with the audience. So as you're scanning the audience as a speaker, even on stage, Look at, find out where that camera is. And of course, event producers can help guide people to that and, and scan them too, because they, they are another important stakeholder. And arguably, sometimes there's more people logged in virtually than in person. So I know I kind of uh, bounced back and forth a little bit there between <laughs> some of the um, together events and the separate, but either way, even if it is pre, even if it was recorded for a later virtual audience, still having that eye contact with the camera can work just as well on stage as it does in a, a situation where I'm looking at a webcam and no one's around me. <laughs> no, I agree with you. No, I think that's a really, really valid point. And you were mentioning earlier talking about speakers and asking them um, to help out with other elements of a presentation. Like for example, if they record their um, keynote address in person and then they are available for a virtual chat, I would just caution uh, folks that are listening to make sure that if you are planning this to negotiate that up front with your speakers, because um, while speakers will be likely willing to do that, some might want to negotiate that as part of their arrangement. So, but I think that's a great idea. And that is something that we're seeing a little bit of um, is that speakers are starting to get leveraged in multiple different ways. 
Um, they're either delivering their content in person, but it's being recorded and then will be streamed out. And that's just an interesting uh, way to approach it. But I did also like what you were talking about um, to remember that you've got this remote audience out there. And don't forget about them when you're in the midst of a hybrid event, because I think that's important to remember as well. Um, you've got multiple audiences. You obviously have folks in the room, and that's a lot easier to connect with when you're on stage. But you want to remember that know where your cameras are. Know when you have the opportunity to connect with your virtual audience, either through chat, either right through your session or after your session. Uh, be accessible for things like that. So I think you've raised some really, really valuable points about how we can make hybrid events uh, more accessible, more cohesive, and more consistent across platforms. So thank you. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Luke, what's the best way for folks that are listening today to reach you? You can check us out on our website. It's puffingston.com, which is P-U-F-F-I-N-G. STON.com. I'm sure we can post that somewhere for people to link to. Yes. So they have to type all that out. Um, and yeah, you can get me at Luke at Puffingston.com. That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. We'll definitely add that into the description and the video. So check that out and give Luke a call if you are interested in getting some help. Um, they've done amazing work with their virtual presentations and I'm a big fan. So thanks Luke for being here today. I appreciate you taking a few minutes and chatting with me about my favorite topic, which is always events. Um, so again, I'm with All American Entertainment. You can visit us online at allamericanspeakers.com. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good one.